is still so many unknowns around this virus. Not only will America dig itself out of this hole they put us in, we're going to build, we're going to build back, and we're going to build back better. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Washington Post Live's coverage of the Democratic National Convention. A little different than usual, but we are here. Our whole team, all of the reporters and columnists will be here all week featuring party leaders. And our first guest today is mm. Tom Perez, the leader of the Democratic Party. He's also an architect for the convention this week, this week's virtual convention. Thousands of people, as we know, including me, we were hoping to be there at an arena in Milwaukee. That's where the chairman is today to watch the Democrats officially nominate Joe Biden as their nominee for president. But due to the coronavirus pandemic, the convention is virtual, uh, mostly. And it will include Vice President Biden's acceptance speech, uh, Senator Harris accepting the vice presidential nomination. And Chairman Perez, you've lined up a lot of heavy hitters in the party to keep this convention going <laughs> online. So let's talk about it. Thanks for being here. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with you and with everyone. It's an exciting week here in Milwaukee and across America. Chairman Perez, we hear a lot this year about the, uh, the campaign being a referendum on President Trump, but a convention is about your party sale, your mm -hmm. message to the country about Joe Biden. What is your focus this week in pitching former Vice President Biden to the nation? Our focus this week is on uniting America and not talking about simply uniting the Democratic Party. We've done had great success there, but this is about uniting America. This is about telling everybody across America, you have a seat at the Democratic Party uh, table. We will be talking about and highlighting what we're doing to build back a better America. We'll be highlighting the leadership of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, the historic partnership. We're gonna be talking about the three pandemics that are confronting America, the coronavirus, the economic collapse that this president's failures have caused, and our civil rights pandemic. And we're gonna be talking all week about how Democrats, our vision for building an America that works for everyone, talking about building back better. And that's what Joe Biden will do. And, and it's not simply a conversation uh, with the luminaries in the party. We're so excited to have Barack Obama and Michelle Obama and other remarkable speakers of that nature. But we're also going to have a convention across America, and people are going to hear from ordinary people doing extraordinary things. The, the paramedic down in Florida, who is uh, the frontline worker, who's also a dreamer down in Florida, and he's doing God's work helping people in the throes of a pandemic. We're going to hear from family, a family farmer who voted for Donald Trump because he trusted him, and he now realizes that that trust was misplaced. So we're going to have an, a week where we unite our nation, where we talk about our values as a party, and where you see our standard bearer, Joe Biden, a man of character, a man of empathy, a man of compassion, a man of accomplishment, with a bold vision uh, to build a better America and to get right to work. Day one, battle tested. Chairman Perez, you listed the crises that are affecting uh, many Americans and their lives. So what do you want the takeaway to be about the message of the Democratic Party? Is this an upbeat and celebratory week uh, at a virtual convention, or is it a very serious tone and takeaway for the viewer? Well, we have three, we, we, we are in crisis in this country. And the question for voters this November is going to be, who can lead us out of these three crises that I have just mentioned? And what we will do this week and what we're going to do for the remaining 78 days is make the case very forcefully that Joe Biden has the character. He has the experience. He understands that you have to listen to the scientists. This president's abject failure to listen at the outset of this pandemic to the experts, his failure to respond, this notion that it's going to disappear magically. He didn't cause the coronavirus, but his botched response has resulted in tragic loss of life. We are so far behind where other countries are doing. Failures of leadership. This campaign and this election is about leadership. It's about trust. Who can you trust to help us build back 
a better America? Who can you trust on the pandemic, the coronavirus? Who can you trust to rebuild the economy? Who can you trust to build an America where it's not us against them, where criminal justice reform is real? And Joe Biden's track record on these issues, the Democrats' mm -hmm. vision on these issues, I think is going to take us forward. And that's what we're going to be talking about. It's a sober moment in our nation's journey. And we need a steady hand at the tiller. That's Joe Biden. And that's Kamala Harris. Chairman Perez, in any newsroom, we always have to adjust to incoming news. We have a plan sometimes for the paper. Then we have to redo it uh, at the 11th hour. You've listed a lot of issues in, in the past few minutes. You have not mentioned the postal crisis. What's your plan in addressing that issue this week? And are you going to talk to the party about having election lawyers ready and a game plan for election day? Oh, we are using every tool in the toolbox and we're building even new tools because this assault on our voting is an assault on our democracy. This president can't win on the merits. And so he has to cheat and it's shameful. It's absolutely shameful. He knows that vote by mail is safe, it's secure, it's easy. He does it himself, his family does it, virtually his entire cabinet does it. But now he's trying to undermine the United States Postal Service and shame on him for doing that. So many millions of Americans depend on the Postal Service for their prescription drugs or their, or their check. Uh, other critical elements of their survival. And you have a president who's deliberately trying to make an institution fail so that he can win his election. But how do you address it doing. as party chairman at the convention? Oh, absolutely. We're going to talk about our vision of winning. Our vision of winning requires making sure that the, uh, the voting process is fair and uh, safe and accessible to everyone. And so uh, that's why we have invested so heavily in building an unprecedented voter protection infrastructure. We've got people on the ground in every state. And what we're saying to people is this very clearly, make a plan, go to IWillVote.com. Wherever you are across the country, you can get the information about whether you're registered. If you're not, you can get the information to register. You can get the information about how to vote early. Make sure you do it early. Make a plan, make it early, register, get your ballot, do that early and get out there and vote. In addition, uh, Speaker Pelosi uh, is reconvening the Congress to address this crisis. We are using the litigation tool. We are organizing everywhere, Robert. Uh, we won an election in Wisconsin this April, even though the Republicans in that state uh, tried to weaponize the pandemic to suppress the vote. And the reason we won that is because we were organizing. We were using digital tools. We got people to get out there and request an absentee ballot. We went to court and we got relief so that those ballots that were sent by election day would be counted. That helped 90,000 voters get enfranchised. So we're using litigation, we're using organizing. We won handily in that state Supreme Court race because we out hustled the other side. And that organizing has enabled us down in Florida and Arizona and elsewhere to get a significant advantage in the number of people who've signed up for vote by mail. We are going to hold the Postal Service accountable for doing their job. Mm -hmm. That's what they have to do. And we will talk about this. This is a civil rights issue. When I hear people like the chief of staff to the president say, there's no, uh, you, you, you can't show that voter fraud doesn't exist. That is horse hooky. I have done that. I've gone to court when I led the Civil Rights Division to show that vote by mail is safe, it's secure, and you shouldn't interfere with it, Mr. President. And so we're going to continue to do this. And you know what? The American people are not going to be deterred or intimidated by these presidents' attempt to deflect. And you will hear a lot of conversation about this at the convention. And here's the deal. People need to have options. If you want to vote in person, you should have the right to vote in person. We should make that as easy as possible. If you want to vote early, we should have the maximum number of early vote days so that you can minimize uh, the lines and be consistent with social distancing. And those who want to vote remotely, vote, by, vote at home, vote by mail, vote absentee, they should be able to do that. And that's what we will continue to fight for. This is about our democracy as we know it. He's not going to get away with this.
Chairman Perez, you just mentioned Mark Meadows, the White House Chief of Staff, and he's a former House member, House former House Republican. Another former House Republican, John Kasich, also the former Ohio governor, will be speaking at your party's convention. As, as tough as your message is against President Trump, beyond the Kasich speech, will there be overtures to GOP voters throughout this convention? There'll be overtures to everyone across America. This is not a convention simply for Democrats or people who voted for Democrats. John Kasich is one of a number of Republicans who will be speaking. I disagree with John Kasich on so many issues of importance, like the right to form a union, women's reproductive health. But we have widespread agreement on the fact that this president has completely obliterated the guardrails of our democracy. And again, uh, viewers tonight will hear not only from uh, uh, Governor Kasich, but they're going to hear from other Republicans who understand. Who else? The who the else, danger. Chairman? Uh, uh, Meg Whitman, uh, Christy Todd Whitman. And you know what? You'll hear from a few more. And we're going to keep a few surprises for later in the week. You're going to hear from people across the ideological spectrum uh, of America, because what we all agree on is we need guardrails in our democracy. And, and that's what I love about Joe Biden. Joe Biden understands the politics of arithmetic. He understands that America's at its best when we engage in addition, not subtraction. And in every state I go to, candidates running up and down the ticket tell me having Joe Biden at the top of the ticket with Kamala Harris is so helpful because Joe Biden's a uniter. And we need a uniter in chief. Uh, a healer in chief, not a tweeter in chief and a divider in chief. And so people will see, um, people, people will hear from leaders uh, with whom they have disagreed. But what we are all in agreement on this week and throughout is the, the, that Joe Biden is the person for the job. And again, Republican, Democrat, Independent, you have a seat at the Democratic Party table because we're going to make sure you have a voice. Chairman Perez, just in the final couple minutes here, you talk about a message of unity. You're reaching out to some Republicans, featuring some Republicans who are supporting Vice President Biden. But we all remember four years ago in Philadelphia, the tensions with the Sanders delegates on the floor there. I know it's virtual, but do you expect any issues, any challenges from the Sanders delegates this time around? We've already approved the platform. The platform is a bold uh, document. It's both uh, inspirational and aspirational. Uh, the input from Senator Sanders and others was invaluable to putting that together. Uh, the vice president and Senator Sanders convened a series of policy groups on critical issues. I, I think our platform, uh, if, you, if you have a pre-existing condition, we're going to protect you. Uh, if you are looking to make sure you can get a job that pays a wage that enables you to feed your family, that's what we're fighting for. Our platform is bold and it is inclusive. And that's what we've done. We've worked really hard over the last four years. We understand that our unity is our greatest strength and Donald Trump's worst nightmare. And we're going to make sure he has a lot of bad nights sleep between now and election day, because we are united as a party. And this convention is about not simply our unity as a party, it's about uniting America. That's when we're at our best, when we are a United States of America. And that's what Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will bring. And are you confident, just a quick follow-up, that the Sanders camp is doing everything in their power to unite around Biden? Oh, Senator Sanders has been a great partner. I, I started working with him back in 2017 on the Unity Reform Commission. Uh, we traveled across this country together so that we could listen and learn uh, together. And everyone, thats we had the unprecedented uh, field, uh, roughly two dozen candidates running for president. Mm -hmm. And what's happening right now and what's been happening, frankly, since April, is every single one of them are working their tails off to help Joe Biden win. Uh, we've got you know, a Republican who ran for president who is helping Joe Biden win uh, this November because, let's face it, the party of Lincoln is dead. It's dead and buried. It's been replaced by the party of Trump, a far-right party that practices the politics of division. We'll probably hear some birtherism next week because they're, they're morally bankrupt. And that's why uh, we are going to win because we are organizing early. We're organizing everywhere. 
We've got a leadership team in Joe Biden and Kamala Harris that are uniting America around a bold vision of building back better. Uh, we're not trying to build back where we were in 2016. Mm -hmm. We're building where we need to go in 2021 and beyond. And that's what we're going to do. Well, we'll see what the party of Biden and Harris looks like this week, the party of Perez. Uh, Mr. Chairman, really appreciate your time on this busy morning. I hope you'll come back around sometime for another conversation here at the Washington Post Live. Thank you, sir. Always a pleasure to be with you. And hang around if you're watching this live stream. Appreciate you joining us this morning. Jen O'Malley Dillon, Joe Biden's campaign manager, will be with us next. to Washington Post Live once again. Uh, we just had Chairman Perez, but now I'd like to welcome the woman in the room behind the scenes working with Vice President Biden and Senator Kamala Harris, Jen O'Malley Dillon. She's former Vice President Biden's campaign manager. She's worked on five presidential campaigns, state and local races. She's worked closely with President Obama in, on his reelection in his first campaign for president in 2008. Jen, really appreciate you being here. So happy to be here. Jen, if we were in the room together, I wish we were at the convention together, a reporter and, and, and uh, campaign official talking politics, but we're here virtually. If we were looking at a map right now, and you've done battleground states for over a decade, what would you tell me is the path to victory right now for the Biden-Harris ticket? Well, I'm glad you started with that because I could talk about the map all day long. Um, and, you know, really our, our goal, our job is to get to 270 electoral votes. And for us, we want to create as many pathways to 270 as possible so that we're not reliant upon one state or one pathway. So we believe that the map really favors the vice president this cycle. It favors him. Uh, it, we have more states in play. We really feel like we have an expansive map. Um, to 270. Um, we really know that our job is to keep as many uh, states competitive for as long as possible uh, and really to ensure that we're building this big, broad coalition that we call the Biden coalition, um, the unique set of voters across the country that we think really makes up um, the support that it's going to take to win in each state. And so uh, obviously this is a national election. We're running for president for the, ho the whole country, um, but we also um, need to win those electoral votes state by state. And we're building our campaign uh, in, in order to do that. And we have uh, a candidate in the vice president who really has a unique ability to speak to this broad coalition um, far greater uh, than, than Donald Trump, certainly. And that's what's putting us in a, in a strong position to 270. But when you think about the map, Jen, we hear so much in our reporting ranks about the industrial Midwest, and certainly that's important. But do you also see Florida or the Sun Belt as just as vital to the Biden strategy? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, I would say that um, it's hard to look at our map and not think about each state uniquely. And, uh, you know, I, I would I would argue that we have a lot of lessons that we have learned out of 2016, we certainly um, 2012 and 2008, you know, so if we start from there, we start with the states that are uh, on the map that we feel pretty confident in, but we really need to do the work. Those are the Virginias, the New Hampshire's, the Colorado's. In 8 and 12, those were really strong battleground states. They are still battleground states, but we are heavily favored. Some people might call them safe states. I certainly don't believe that. Um, I believe that we have to do the work to ensure uh, that we uh, continue to maintain our support there. Then you look at that sort of traditional swing state uh, list. That is uh, some of the states that you were referencing. It's Pennsylvania, it's Wisconsin, uh, it's Michigan. It is also though Florida and North Carolina and Arizona. And in those states, we obviously don't have to win all of them. It certainly depends on which states we win based on the size um, of how many of them we need, two, three, four. Um, in those states, uh, we really have, we're ahead in the polling now, although that's just a snapshot in time, um, but we are competitive across the board and they are generally gonna be states that will tighten up a bit, certainly between here uh, and November because they are swing states. Uh, they have swung either way uh, in previous elections. Those are the states that 
Donald Trump won in 16 that we obviously are focused on winning back. Arizona, I talk about a great deal. Uh, the campaign staff kid me often because I talk about it so much. It has never really truly been a battleground state at the level that it is. And some of that's because of the trends over the last several um, cycles. Some of that's because of the important work that's been done on the ground. Um, Mark Kelly is uh, really running an incredibly strong campaign. We're going to work very closely with him. We are working very closely with him. But it is truly a battleground. And then you look at states like uh, Ohio and Iowa and Georgia and Texas. All of those states are on the map. We're within the margin. We're ahead, depending on what polling you're looking at. Um, and, and we are doing the work to ensure that they're in play. So our job is to make sure that we are keeping at all these pathways open to us, that we're not relying on a historical sense of uh, where the race should be. We're looking for opportunities wherever possible. We're going on offense wherever possible. Uh, we're playing these states in a way that Democrats haven't uh, ever before, and we're doing it to, to win, uh, which I think is, is a place that we're not seeing uh, as much of as you look to uh, Donald Trump's recent strategy in the states he's playing uh, in, which is a much smaller uh, number of states that we're seeing right now than where we're being uh, we're competitive and where we're spending our resources. And what about the South, Jen? You think about Georgia, Stacey Abrams' campaign in 2018 for governor came close. Democrats are always trying to come back in the South. Could 2020 be the year? And what would it take to start to win a state like Georgia again at the presidential level? Absolutely. I mean, look, I, I think 2020 is the year. I think for sure, um, of whether you know we're talking about Florida, whether we're looking about, at Georgia, you know, these are states that are uh, really changing demographically uh, over year after year. Uh, they are states where uh, there is just stronger electoral population and support of Democrats that continues to trend in our direction. Uh, they are also states, as you were mentioning, in Georgia. I had the the opportunity to work with uh, Stacey Abrams on her campaign in 2018, um, and. And the work uh, has been done, the foundation has been laid for us to build on in a way that we had not seen previously. So I think that the, the states in the South are real opportunities for us. Um, you know, they are places that we have uh, strong support where we're growing the electorate, uh, where we're continuing to see, um, you know, real opportunity, uh, both locally and also at the national level. Uh, and we have leaders like Stacey Abrams that are helping pave the way. Uh, and that has a real impact on our ability to do the job of engaging voters and ensuring that they turn out to vote. You use the phrase, Jen, the Biden coalition. What does that in include? Does, does that include the Sanders voter to the John Kasich Republican who doesn't like President Trump's leadership? What does that look like, that Biden coalition? I'm glad you asked that because I honestly believe that Vice President Biden has a truly unique ability to bring people together. And I think you're seeing that in so many ways. Certainly, you're seeing that from day one uh, in terms of uh, the campaign he's led and the voices uh, and his the, the message he's, he's driven across the country. You're seeing that in a historic uh, numbers of turnout and enthusiasm behind uh, his candidacy in the primaries, you're seeing that in how quickly uh, we were able to bring the party together for Senator Sanders to come on board. Uh, that is certainly a testament to the vice president and to, to bringing uh, uh, support across the board. You know, as you heard Chairman Perez talk about, this convention is about uh, welcoming everyone, whoever you are, whoever you voted for before, wherever you live, uh, wherever you come from, you are welcome in our party in this convention, but you are welcome uh, as part of the vice president's uh, candidacy. Um, you know, we really look at that and we think there's real opportunity to continue to grow that coalition. So yes, of course, it is making sure that we're speaking uh, to the, the base of our party, to um, our core uh, groups that are always uh, driving forward, showing up to vote, doing the work, the heart and soul of our communities, African-American women, um, you know, across the board, Democrats, we've really united the party. You're seeing that and all the polling, the support that the vice president has, um, you know, is, is, is completely united behind him. Then you look at the voters that came on board in, in 2018 that have been, uh, and, and we're continuing to see as well, trending in our direction, suburban voters, 
um, uh, more women voters, suburban uh, women voters in particular. We're seeing that was a huge driver in support uh, for, for the House um, um, winning uh, in 2018, and, and we're continuing to see those trends. Uh, and then you look at, you know, this broader group of generally uh, disaffected voters. Maybe these are voters that have been moving away from Democrats in recent years. Um, you know, they, they're, they're voters in, in some of the communities we've just been talking about. They're young voters. Um, you know, we are doing the work um, to reach these voters, to make sure that they know that they have a voice in this coalition, that uh, the vice president not only uh, is a leader for them, but also is carrying their voice in how he's leading, uh, and that we are spending the time to make sure uh, that we're having that conversation mm -hmm. about what's at stake in this country. So we really kind of look at that broad coalition across the country, across these different groups. Um, we think about senior voters, for instance, that are, are uh, in support of the vice president in significant numbers, um, so far ahead of any uh, Democrat in recent memory. Um, that's certainly uh, about the vice president's leadership. It's of course about Donald Trump. We do believe this is a referendum on Donald Trump. Uh, and we're seeing that in the support uh, and, and the concern that, that uh, voters have, seniors in particular, with uh, Trump's leadership around, and, or frankly, lack of leadership around uh, COVID and, and the economy. Um, but we believe that the vice president uh, to win must build a broad coalition. And we believe that he is uh, he's doing just that. And, and I would just add, I think he's uniquely qualified to do that. I'd be hard pressed. Mm -hmm. Uh, to imagine, um, you know, a, a build back better economic plan, uh, the likes of which the vice president rolled out over the last several weeks that uh, talked about, um, you know, made in America, as well as a clean energy future, as well as a caregiving economy in the way the vice president did. And, and that's because voters trust him across the board. And that's what they're uh, driving home to the support and the growth that we have on the campaign. Jen, those voters Many of them also would like to see Vice President Biden, see Senator Harris on the campaign trail. But we are in the middle of a pandemic, an economic crisis, but especially a pandemic that raises health issues. As campaign manager, how do you deal with that issue? You want the candidates to travel, perhaps, but will they travel in the coming months? So, um, you know, it's it's hard to imagine how much I've been thinking about this and the whole campaign has. You know, our job is to meet with and show up to voters wherever they are. So I am far less concerned about the travel restrictions as I am making sure that we are spending the time and building community and connection and engaging with voters during this time of, of crisis. You know, we often say people come to a campaign for the candidate, they often stay for the experience, the, uh, the participation, the empowerment, the people that they're with. So how do we recreate that in, in a virtual way? How do we ensure that we are creating opportunities to build connection that aren't just looking like they have in the past just because that's the way we do things, but they're really rethought anew. Um, and that means a lot to us as a campaign as we've thought about our new organizing model, as we've thought about how do we reach voters while not putting them in harm's way or our teams or our volunteers in harm's way? How do we ensure that we make connections and we have quality conversations? Um, and that doesn't always mean that it's just to say, um, you know, I, I want to know how you feel about this election specifically, or, you know, are, are you with us or against us? Uh, it's It's been far less partisan than that. It's first and foremost showing up for people and saying, how are you doing? What's going on? Um, you know, how can we be helpful? How is your community handling that? What's your life like? And that foundation we've been communicating with and building on uh, week after week during this crisis, really showing up for our voters. So what does that mean for us tactically? Well, it means, frankly, uh, that we've not stopped and missed one beat in how we engage with voters, um, that we're doing it uh, whether uh, wherever they, they want to be met, that's where we're going to be. So some of that's digitally. Um, certainly, we're reaching people in new ways, um, digitally across platforms, showing up on those platforms, uh, working across this broad uh, coalition of surrogates and supporters that we have uh, on their networks as well as ours. Um, but we're also using traditional tactics uh, in ways that honestly, um, you know, have had some pretty profound impact. Phone calls, are much more prevalent and more successful. I, I know we're seeing this in polling, um, more people responding, 
we're certainly seeing this in the work that we're doing in the campaign. Our ability to have conversations, I know I say all the time, sometimes I'm just happy not to talk to someone in my family that I'm stuck in the house with. Um, so we're seeing that. Uh, we're seeing that over texting. And so what we're really focused on is building community, um, making sure that we are doing the work of voter contact, but we're doing that in a way that is safe uh, and that allows people to make those connections. The final thing I just say on this is, um, you know, the vice president is reaching millions and millions and millions of people as he's engaging with folks. Um, he's doing that certainly when we're able and you've seen us travel uh, to do that. He's doing that, um, you know, uh, throughout this past week as we rolled out uh, Senator Harris as our, our running mate, who is just um, so phenomenal and amazing. And it's just been such a wonderful week uh, to lead us into this next wonderful week. Um, but we are really looking for the opportunities about how we can more broaden uh, our reach. You're seeing that with the convention as well. Um, you know, we we believe while there's challenges here, there's real opportunities and, and we're really uh, capitalizing that. And I think you're we're certainly seeing that with how we're organizing and how we're reaching people. And one of those challenges you face, and we just talked about it with Chairman Perez, is the postal crisis. When you're sitting there looking at all your data, how many votes do you expect to come through the mail this fall? And how are you preparing for dealing with those votes and the postal crisis at the same time? Yeah, of course, this is, and, and Chairman spoke to this very well. I mean, this is a top of mind for everyone. Fundamentally, as a campaign, our job is to ensure that we are doing everything we can uh, to make it uh, as easy and accessible for people to vote in the way that they want to vote in their lives, whether that's vote by mail, whether that's early uh, in person, whether that's on election day. Um, we are doing the work to ensure that we are minimizing the chaos. We know that Donald Trump's strategy uh, is one of subtraction. Uh, it is uh, certainly clear from everything that we're seeing Every metric we look at on the campaign uh, that our campaign is is growing. It's growing in support. It's growing in uh, donations. It's growing in engagement. It's it's growing across every metric that we look at to determine success and to make sure that we're on track. It's hard to see Donald Trump's path as positive as ours at the moment. And so he sees this as a game of subtraction. And certainly that's in part what we're doing. Part of his strategy, which we saw in Wisconsin, we saw in Georgia, is creating chaos, to make it more confusing for people to participate in this process. Our job as the campaign is to ensure that we're doing the exact opposite. We're breaking through that chaos. We're doing everything we can on the front end to prevent things that we think will really harm people's abil uh, ability to participate. But we're also doing as much to ensure that we are supporting voters in showing up and voting. Um, and that means in places like Arizona, where 70% of the population is on, uh, it, it votes um, by mail, they're on the permanent um, uh, absentee list. Um, they, are, they are voters who do this year after year. They know how to do this work. So now our job is to just make sure that they know they've got to get that application and their ballot in early, as early as possible to give the post office the time that it needs to. There is no doubt that there is a political um, work at play here, and and you know we welcome um, the leadership Speaker Pelosi is showing on this issue. We are obviously um, very concerned about the operational changes that are being put in place two months before an election. We also acknowledge that we're in a pandemic, and postal workers themselves are doing everything they can uh, to do the best job that they can with very little support. Um, and so our job is to make sure our voters know that there is a way to participate safely that we are helping them do that. Every state is different. Every uh, you know jurisdiction is different. How do we make sure we communicate that? How do we support voters from an end-to-end -end standpoint? So from registration all the way to vote uh, and make it as easy as possible uh, and then make sure that we're executing on that. So I feel very confident that we are gonna be able to execute our strategies and reach our voters. I am also very confident that Donald Trump's gonna do everything he can to try to stand in that way. And, and we're gonna ensure that we have the resources and the focus to stop that. At the same time, you certainly mm -hmm. we are very focused on ensuring that we do everything we can to maintain the best process possible uh, to support people voting and voting by mail uh, and doing that as early as possible. Jen, just to pause there, when you talk about executing the plan, we keep hearing from top Democrats, lawyers are ready. The House Speaker is bringing back uh, the Congress, at least the House, 
to debate this issue and discuss this issue. But can you offer any more specifics or details about what the Biden campaign is doing on the ground or virtually to address this ongoing postal crisis? Yeah, I mean, look, I will speak more broadly. I will say that we will have the largest voter protection effort that has ever been conducted on a presidential campaign. And I can say that because I've been part of uh, each one for the last uh, 20 years in presidential politics. Um, You know, we have always been equipped to ensure that we're doing all we can to support voters uh, to vote um, in any way they they can and what's uh, available to them in their states. So, That certainly means we are looking at a very sophisticated, complex, multi-pronged approach across every lever that's available to us. That includes certainly litigation. That includes certainly um, uh, political coordination uh, and um, and, and legislative efforts. That certainly includes, um, you know, support supporting the jurisdictions that are executing on this election. Um, you know, we we know, again, if we go look at the primary, the challenge in Georgia was less, um, you know, um, malicious intent and more the fact that poll workers that traditionally work the polls uh, cycle after cycle, are, they're older voters, um, maybe in the time of COVID, were not able to participate in the same way. So you had new um, poll workers who were less trained or did not have the training that didn't have the experience that those mechanisms mechanisms weren't put in place. So we're very focused on how do we support uh, the participation and execution of an election in uh, you know a a pandemic, which has not ever been done before, and and that we recognize that there are uh, you know there are real challenges that need to be supported uh, through in a different way. Certainly, we are very focused on making sure that we are supporting our voters and meeting them where they are. What I can tell you is that in all of the work that we're doing now, the voter engagement, the research we are seeing because of what is at stake in this country, because of the support that the vice president is carrying, people are gonna find a way to vote. uh, And they just need to make sure that they have that information. So we will have uh, online, uh, I think the chairman mentioned, IWillVote.com, we will be um, executing the most robust advertising strategy uh, and uh, resource allocation um, across all of our advertising channels to reach voters around voting in particular. Um, We are going to be doing it earlier than ever before. Um, Often we talk about um, in elections, you're sort of building, and we call it the backwards uh, hockey stick, right? Everything kind of builds up to maximum capacity right before the election. Well, because we're in a pandemic, because of these concerns about mail and timing because of these unique laws state by state, we're gonna have a number of places that that hockey stick, that backwards hockey stick starts uh, in early September and continues at a very high peak all the way through um, November. So we feel very confident that we not only have the operational ability to execute on this, we also have the right strategy uh, to ensure that we're reaching voters and we're supporting them through that process and we're doing that on the front end. And our goal is going to be pushing people to participate and vote, to know it's safe uh, across the board, to know the way that they can vote and to make sure whatever they're doing, they're doing it as early as possible, while also ensuring um, that we're supporting uh, a heavy amount of turnout across this. We expect um, turnout to be greater than uh, than any presidential before us. Uh, and we're gonna ensure that that takes place even during a pandemic. You, you believe turnout will be higher than any other time in American history? Yeah, so I mean, certainly in recent history, we expect turnout to be higher in, in, than in 16. Uh, and, and you know, we're going to do all we can to make sure that we're supporting voters as they turn out. Jen, you've worked closely with President Obama over the years. You're running the Biden-Harris campaign as campaign manager. But in these strange times, tough times with the pandemic, you may rely on some major figures like beyond the ticket, such as President Obama. What is going to be his role beyond the speech this week in the final stretch of this campaign? Well, look at, you know, the first thing I'd say is, you know, uh, the vice president is such a tremendous candidate. And for me to have the opportunity to work with him has been, um, you know, a a really uh, special experience and one that, um, you know, is allowing us to, to really partner together 
not just with uh, you know former candidates and and as you said, President Obama, um, you know they're they're out there doing the work. And so often you have in a primary um, people coming together and saying, you know, we support you and and kind of checking the box on that, um, but not really engaging as much as um, one might hope. And in this campaign and in support of the vice president, it has been so amazing to see the just breadth and depth of support and action. Um, the vice president supporters are taking uh, to help us, reaching out to their own networks, uh, making sure that they're helping us, whether it's uh, fundraisers to grassroots engagement. Um, we certainly are seeing that with President Obama um, and is, uh, you know, something that it's honestly, at the end of the day, we know it's going to take everyone uh, in order to make sure that we, um, you know, uh, that we win and we save democracy. Um, but we're seeing such tremendous support across the board, but also support in action. Um, and that's something that we are going to continue to see, um, you know, President Obama has been a great partner across the board. Um, you know, we have really had wonderful opportunities for voters to see um, the vice president and President Obama talking um, and, you know, going through some of the real serious uh, issues that this country is facing, such incredibly serious issues and reminding voters what uh, what this country needs and deserves in leadership. And I think that you're seeing that come through in everything the vice president's doing uh, in many ways serving as the voice of president as he's uh, running for president. You saw that in some of the advertising we did in, in our first ad in Texas and our ads in Arizona and Florida. Um, they didn't say vote for us. Um, they weren't talking about the politics of, of the campaign. They were talking about how important it is to wear a mask. And also more importantly to say, we know that this is hard, but you're gonna get through it. And all of that um, directly from the vice president. So, you know, that kind of leadership we're gonna continue to see from him and it inspires the support uh, and the action of so many other leaders in our country. Um, and that's what I'm so excited about the convention this week. I, you know, I, I'll put our team up against any team, any day of the week. I think you're going to see the full breadth of this country over the next four days, uh, telling the story of this country, uh, telling the story of how seriously we need leadership uh, in, in this crisis, these multiple crises that we're going through, uh, and how our party is, is stepping up to that because of the tremendous leadership we have uh, across the board. Jen, in just the final few minutes here, I was asking some of your colleagues about you, and they say, Jen, she's all business, total professional. Uh, she doesn't want to talk about herself. But just, can you just tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a campaign manager for a major party ticket in a pandemic? Your candidate is in Delaware working from home. You're likely working from home. How does this all work? And how is your relationship right now with Vice President Biden, someone you, you knew but perhaps didn't know so well when you joined this campaign? Well, I, I mean, I, I feel like um, as someone who really has done presidential races for the majority of my career, that's um, in part how I started, I think all of that has helped build uh, for this this moment in this campaign. You know, I am, I honestly feel so fortunate to work for the vice president. Um, he, he and I, uh, in some ways, we come from the same place. My parents are, uh, you know, former public school teachers and, um, you know, uh, really share uh, similar values. And I think that um, we've, we've really formed a, a great partnership. Um, but, you know, his leadership is what's got us here. And, and one of the things that I think is, you know, so important to say is obviously I came a little bit later to this team um, than many that have been on this team before. But the foundation was laid from the beginning. I mean, the vice president said from day one, there's a whole reason in getting in this race and what this country needed was speaking to the soul of the nation. Um, and that has not changed for one second. That strategy, that message, the authenticity of our candidate has been carried from the primary. It is what propelled him to win and has taken us into the general election. You know, I know that campaigns are very important. Um, my job is to help make sure that we are doing all we can to not be constrained by the way it's been done before, to acknowledge that we are in an unprecedented time and we need to rethink everything we thought we knew about organizing and campaigns, um, that we get the fundamentals right, uh, that we don't get strayed by um, what I call the bells and whistles of campaigning uh, or the distractions that Donald Trump has put up there, but that we also um, make sure that we're staying focused on our goals uh, and, and ultimately our path to victory and stay very disciplined to that. It's very easy for me to do my job when uh, I have a candidate like the vice president. And at the end of the day, 
Uh, we as a campaign are only as good as our candidate and our leadership, and uh, we are only as good uh, And if we're built in the essence of who our candidates are. That is certainly what was behind the success of President Obama. Um, we talk all the time about how he was a community organizer and we created our campaign in that likeness. That is the same way we're building this campaign. The vice president speaks to real people every day. He carries their voices with him. Um, he is someone that understands what people in this country are going to through. You know, he's he's not only a leader that can lead because of experience, uh, having taken us through a crisis before, but he has the empathy to understand and connect with voters uh, and really see them from his own personal experience and lived experience to his leadership. And so our job as a campaign is to just make sure we're amplifying that, um, that we're executing on that, we're telling that story, um, and we're making sure that it's clear um, that while this is a referendum on Donald Trump, it is also an opportunity to color in uh, a little bit more of who the vice president is and his leadership and his vision for the country. Um, and I feel like, you know, we have been able to come through that. And that's a testament as a campaign uh, to our team um, from the folks that started from the beginning to the new um, members that have joined. Um, I really just am so inspired by um, the fact that our team has, you know, it, it's not an abstract idea that they're doing this work during the campaign. They're all being impacted themselves just like everyone else in the country is. And so they bring that sense of understanding about what's happening uh, to the voters they're talking to because they are living through it and it's a shared experience. And I think fundamentally, that is what has allowed us to build this campaign and to be ready for this moment. And it is a reflection of who the vice president is and his leadership that's carrying us forward. Jen, I have a million more questions, but we're gonna have to leave it there. Let you get back to work. Appreciate you taking the time as this Democratic convention begins. Thanks very much. So great to be here with you today. Thanks so much. Come back sometime and good luck this week. Thank you, will do. And thank all of you for joining us for Post Live. It's a special week for any political junkie, uh, anyone who loves reporting and great editorials. The Washington Post is gonna be here all week, all day and night to help you understand what's going on with the Democratic national convention, this virtual convention. It's not the same. I, I, I miss going to these uh, restaurants and coffee shops with sources in the cities and seeing everybody up close. But we're going to do the best we can, have a little fun along the way. And just go to Post Live's website, WashingtonPostLive.com or WashingtonPost.com to read all of our reporting, to see the schedule of what's coming up. There's so much going on. I, I, it would take me a long time to read your whole itinerary. But believe me, it's online. Check it out and uh, stick with us. We'll be here covering this in depth. Thanks very much.